CBS News has identified five of the six people who are possibly the co-conspirators listed in Donald Trump's most recent indictment. These identities were determined by matching what's in the document to our previous reporting. The first possible co-conspirator appears to be the former president's ex-attorney, Rudy Giuliani. In the hours after the indictment was unsealed, Giuliani addressed the allegations. Let's listen. No way I can confirm or deny that because they have not sent me a target letter, a subject letter, and any kind of letter. Uh, everything I know about this is uh, exculpatory. This is a historic and very, very sad indictment because it's probably one of the biggest attacks the United States government has made on free speech in our very, very long and illustrious history. Joining me now is Tim Hafey. He's former lead investigator for the House January 6th Committee. Tim, uh, as you well know from the indictment, there are six co-conspirators. They are not mentioned, but one of them is thought to be former New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani, attorney for former President Trump. And he has said, and our audience just heard, that this indictment is, in his words, an assault on free speech. I like your reaction to that. Well, there's a difference, Major, between speech and conduct. We protect speech in this country, have for a long time, as we should, but we don't protect illegal conduct. So what the special counsel has alleged here was that this was not simply speech. This was not simply rhetoric. This was rhetoric designed to actually provoke a response and did provoke a response. So this, this may very well be the defense that comes forth in this trial, that this is an attempt to punish free speech. The response to that will be the president had just continued to say the election was stolen, but did not take act to essentially implement a strategy to prevent the election from being certified, then it wouldn't be a crime. It's the acts that are criminal, not the speech. So one way to think about this, Tim, and correct me if I'm wrong, is if the former president had just said in any capacity as president, I think the election was stolen, but hadn't set in motion any effort to pressure state legislatures, create false slates of electors, or tell people who were filling out those fraudulent elector slates that they would only be used if the president were to prevail in a legal challenge and under no other set of circumstances, if those actions hadn't been taken, this would be free speech. But because those other actions were taken and is serially documented in the indictment, this becomes criminal. Yes, just exactly right. Now, you could argue that it would still be reprehensible, that it would still be irresponsible, that there are a lot of other judgments that would pass upon advocacy of a, of a false position or a position without evidentiary basis. But it wouldn't be criminal unless the speech were part of a very uh, specific plan that was intended to disrupt an official proceeding and defraud the United States. That, again, is conduct, not speech. That's what's at stake here. And the uh, select committee made several criminal referrals after concluding its investigation. Some were incorporated into this indictment. Is this indictment, as you've read it, Tim, as broad as the select committee thought it could be or less so? Look, it reads very much like the select committee report. It actually reads very, very close to Liz Cheney, the vice chair's opening statement in our first hearing, where she methodically marched through the multi-part plan that President Trump and his conspirators uh, enacted to prevent the certification. There is a menu here of fact and of federal statutes from which the special counsel could choose in crafting an indictment. My guess is there are additional facts beyond the indictment that the special counsel's team has developed. There are certainly other criminal charges that could have applied, but I think he has picked the two that most closely fit the facts, obstruction of an official proceeding and conspiracy. Those were two of the statutes that we specifically referred for his consideration when the select, com select committee completed its work. Tim, I think you have a unique perspective on this. One of the first reactions that came from the former president on his social media platform was, why didn't they do this two and a half years ago? I think you are pretty familiar with the timeline here, but address that allegation from the former president that this is timed only to inhibit his campaign for the Republican nomination in 2024. Yeah, Major, I, I can't speak to the pace of the Department of Justice and the decisions that were made internally. I think facts make cases. 
facts inform investigations. And I think the select committee's identification of facts that gave rise to the violations of federal criminal law was a hugely important step forward and showed not just the Justice Department, but the country that what happened here was a specifically intended multi-part plan to disrupt the joint session. Once those facts became evident, and that was because courageous people stepped forward and told the truth because the select committee, you know, my clients, the nine members of the committee put that case together. The Department of Justice really had little choice at that point, but to, to dig further. And that's why we're here. It's, it's not because of lawyers or it's not because of uh, decisions that were made. It's because of facts. And the facts here have brought us to this point. And is it your belief, Tim Hafey, that the select committee's work accelerated or incentivized the Justice Department? Because I know there was for a time a disagreement about access to transcripts and the like. When history records the precipitating factor, how large do you believe the select committee's work will loom? Look, I, I think the select committee was successful in uncovering really important facts. And again, facts matter. I think the facts that we uncovered were not yet known to the Justice Department or to anyone else. And the fact that we were able to get Bill Barr on videotape talking about all of the investigations that he did and Cassidy Hutchinson courageously standing up and talking about all of the conversations that she was present for, that moved the needle factually. And, and again, I, I can't speculate as to what was going on inside the Justice Department, but the facts here that I think we successfully put together are what motivated conduct and have led us to this place. You are, as I understand it, a criminal defense attorney. Is that correct? I'm a white collar uh, and investigations lawyer at Wilkie, Farr and Gallagher. Yes. If uh, the former president were your client, what kind of defense would you be mounting? I'm not really sure I see a viable defense here. I, I, what I've heard from his lawyers is some kind of reliance on advice of counsel. That does not square again, with the fact, it is not a legal defense to rely on legal advice that is patently unreasonable, that has no foundation in fact or law. Special counsel goes through very specifically in the indictment, all of the lawyers and others that repeatedly told the president, there is no evidence of systemic election fraud. The vice president does not have the authority to unilaterally reject slates of electors. The fact that one other lawyer may have unreasonably told him otherwise does not create a defense because that's an unreasonable uh, piece of advice. So I don't know, Major, what the defense here will be. The president's presumed innocence, as mm -hmm. any other criminal defendant, as he should be. He'll have an opportunity to challenge this evidence in court, as is his right. I'll be looking forward to seeing how that plays out. And Tim, before I let you go, one last quick question. Because the presidency is a singular position in our country and within our government and carries with it an obligation to see that the Constitution is followed in that manner of talking about, well, I was just taking advice from a lawyer. Is there a higher standard for a president to understand what is or isn't within the bounds of the Constitution and therefore live within that? Yeah, Major, that's a good question, but it's really a political question. Ultimately, presidents, like all elected officials, are accountable to voters. That's a little bit beyond my expertise, right? I, I'm the lawyer, and I can say— It doesn't create a higher fact. legal standard, in other words. No, it doesn't. Okay. I mean, he is held to the same legal standard. The government has to prove specific intent to take action with others that obstructed that official proceeding. That's why his belief about election fraud— um, is so important. Tim Hafey, lead investigator for the House Select Committee on January 6th. We thank you for your time. Thank you.